Welcome to Pirate TV. Today we're talking with Bruce Gagnon, the co-founder and coordinator of the Global Network Against Weapons and Nuclear Power in Space. Last time we had you on, Bruce, you gave an extraordinary presentation of the U.S. intervention and meddling in Ukraine. This was a year ago last April. A lot has happened since then, but as time goes on, a lot of those things that you were talking about, which I have to admit were new to me at the time, are turning out as time goes on to be more and more true. So uh, I remember you said that this all stemmed from a fact-finding tour you did of Eastern Ukraine in the Donbass region. Can you elaborate on that? Actually, I went there in 2019, but that was really five years after I got into this issue. Uh, when the U.S. orchestrated the coup d'etat in Kiev, uh, in, inside of Ukraine, in 2014, at that time, Obama was president. He sent Assistant Secretary of State Victoria Nuland there to do the uh, groundwork. And then Joe Biden, then vice president, was overall in charge of the coup. And the U.S. installed a right-wing uh, Nazi backed, basically, the muscle of the Nazis, uh, put them in power and kept them in power. And so uh, one of the first things they did in this new government was to declare that the speaking of Russian would be illegal in Ukraine. Now, just imagine that, uh, particularly in the Donbass region, that's the part of Ukraine right near the Russian border. It's mostly a coal mining region. Uh, these people are Russian ethnics. And so they didn't really go for this, uh, this new rule that you couldn't speak Russian anymore. You couldn't uh, teach it in the schools anymore. You couldn't speak it in local shops anymore. That would be like uh, telling Californians and people in New Mexico and Arizona that Spanish was illegal to speak in the United States. So what the people did was they started organizing peaceful marches where they were calling for a federated Ukraine. That meant that they wanted to have local autonomy. They wanted to be able to speak whatever language they wished. They wanted to be able to elect their local officials like mayors and city council people rather than have them appointed by the new right-wing government in Kiev. And uh, they also began collecting signatures for a referendum. They wanted a national referendum on this question of a federated Ukraine. They'd still be part of Ukraine, but they would have more local autonomy. And so as this played out in 2014, I was watching this literally daily on YouTube, watching videos that were being uploaded sometimes live. And what I saw was that Nazis were being sent from Western Ukraine, where they've historically uh, uh, been uh, predominant uh, part of the culture, part of the, the, of the Ukrainian society. And so the people were attacked. And so, so suddenly uh, the workers from the coal mines, musicians, electricians, teachers, daycare workers, people came out of their jobs and formed self-defense forces literally to protect their families. For example, Mariupol has been in the news a lot lately because of the Nazi, the Azov battalion hunkered down inside of uh, underground bunkers and at the steelworks. They've just recently surrendered, uh, 2,000 of them surrendered to the Russians. Uh, but anyway, uh, I was watching in 2014, 2015, when people were holding these marches, the Nazis came in from the Azov Battalion and they began mowing people down in the streets with machine guns, innocent people. And so again, these self-defense forces started. And eventually some of the you, the regular army of Ukraine 
that were mostly from that Don, uh, Donetsk and Lugansk area. Uh, they were coming in with heavy equipment, tanks and other uh, uh, armored personnel carriers. They were sent in there to suppress the people, but because they were from that region, uh, they were ethnic Russians themselves. They began to say, we don't want to kill our own people, our own relatives, basically. So they began turning over their equipment to the self-defense forces. And so this is how they first became armed. But eventually, again, the uh, more Nazis were sent in with more heavy equipment, and they began shelling the cities of Donetsk and Lugansk there in the Donbass region of eastern Ukraine. I know about this uh, also because one of my friends has a son who was in the U.S. Army Special Forces, and he was stationed at this time at Fort Carson, Colorado. And the troops from Fort Carson, Colorado were sent to Western Ukraine, again, the region where the Nazis predominate. And they were sent there to train the Nazis and bring them into new special forces units that were created inside the Ukrainian army. So this is how really things began uh, in 2014 and 2015. And since that time, uh, about 150,000 to 180,000 Ukrainian troops have been positioned at this line of contact, as they call it, inside the Donbass region, right near the Russian border. Again, constantly shelling the cities of Donetsk and Lugansk, small towns, little uh, rural villages as well, constantly uh, shelled by these Nazi forces who were equipped by the US and NATO all these years. Well, Russia uh, didn't respond initially. They were talking with uh, uh, the US, with Germany, with France, with other countries uh, in the uh, in the European Union, trying to get them to help stabilize the situation, trying to get them to uh, create a peaceful solution. And eventually the Minsk I and Minsk II agreements were signed between the Ukrainian government, Germany, France, Belarus, and the, uh, the uh, uh, people's republics that were declared in the Donbass region called the LPR and the DPR, the Lugansk People's Republic and the Donetsk People's Republic. They got so tired of being killed, they got so tired of being shelled, they declared themselves as separatist republics. So over the years, 14,000 people have died at the hands of the Nazis, 34,000 wounded. And the interesting thing is, is that the Minsk agreements that called for a ceasefire, a withdrawal of the heavy equipment away from the line of contact that Ukraine signed, they never implemented. No matter what uh, Russia tried to do to get them to honor the Minsk agreements, uh, the Kiev government at the instructions, clearly at the instructions of the United States refused to implement these these uh, agreements and continued again the shelling, the constant shelling. So this has gone on for the last eight years, bringing us to the point where we are uh, essentially today. And then in February, February 24th, having learned that the United States was instructing the Kiev government to send its 180,000 troops that it had lined up there along that line of contact, they were going to do an invasion of Crimea and of the Lugansk and, and Donetsk cities. They would have overrun these communities because the uh, self-defense forces in those communities were only about 50,000 in each community. So they would have been easily overrun by the superior forces of these Ukrainian forces. And it was at that point 
that Russia decided that they would preempt this attack that was planned, that they learned about through their intelligence sources. And so that is how this whole so-called uh, special military operation by Russia began. Well, um, I think something we need to add is that uh, the uh, breakaway republics finally uh, declared that they were independent republics, right? And th this was in February, you know, right before that. And then Russia recognized them and then they requested that Russia intervene. That's correct. And essentially, uh, by that, by them declaring themselves as independent republics and inviting Russia to, to help them, uh, they were able to, under international law, create the justification for that Russian support. And it's a very important point for those that say that what Russia did was illegal. It, it really isn't, because uh, under Article 51 of the UN Charter, uh, they they had justification because of of those uh, those moves that you just referred to. Yeah, so I want to talk about the Nazis a little bit because you know we're hearing these reports even on this channel that uh, the Azov Battalion well they're kind of Nazi light now you know they're not really totally Nazis like that they were and the media has been covering this ever since 2014, but then they suddenly stopped, right? And, uh, but uh, there's a whole history of the United States arming these nationalist Nazis, you know, going back to World War II. So it's, uh, it's an old game. And uh, I was reading this uh, book, Legacy of Ashes, the history of the CIA by Tim Weiner. The CIA, right from the very beginning, was training these nationalist neo-Nazis from Western Ukraine and, and Poland in the United States and other places and dropping them into the Soviet Union. And this is in the 40s, right after the CIA was created. The Soviets captured or killed all of them, but that didn't stop the CIA. It reminds me of Keystone Cops. Uh, and I, I just, just struck by reading this, what a bunch of idiots they were. But uh, as we saw from the clips of Ukraine on fire, the United States utilized the neo-Nazis, such as the right sector, to overthrow the government in the Maidan coup. And soon after that, the Azov Battalion and other militias were formed to attack Russian-speaking Ukrainians in the Donbass, when Ukrainian conscript soldiers reluctant, were reluctant to fire on their own citizens. And they had a draft, and um, I was reading an account of that, and uh, the uh, Ukrainian people didn't want to show up to shoot fellow Ukrainians, right? So only 80, like 80% 80 of the people didn't show up for the draft, and then the second draft, it was 90%, uh, right? They wouldn't even show up, and a, a, lot, a lot of young people were just leaving Ukraine. And, and then so Ukraine seems to have an overabundance of fascist militias, militias, not just the right sector and others. That's correct. You know, uh, at the end of World War II, the U.S. government, the U.S. military, created a program called Operation Paperclip where they smuggled 1,500 former Nazis into the US and they seeded the entire military industrial complex with them. For example, Reinhard Galen, who was Hitler's chief of intelligence for Eastern Europe during World War II, was brought to help create the CIA. And he brought with him what's called his rat line, all his uh, fascist uh, contacts throughout Eastern Europe. So this basically what you just described is very much uh, supported by historical evidence. And so the United States uh, then armed these people, trained them and put them to work destabilizing the former Soviet Union. But what happened with Galen? Well, after a couple of years of working in Washington, 
helping to create the CIA, Galen was sent back to Germany. Uh, at this point, Germany was divided between East and West Germany. Uh, and uh, West Germany being the uh, capitalist side and uh, East Germany being the communist side allied with the former Soviet Union. Well, Galen was put in charge of the equivalent of the West German CIA. So here you had uh, at the end of the war, one of the lead top guys in the uh, Nazi intelligence goes back to West Germany, the so-called free side of Germany, and takes over as head of intelligence. And his job then is to continue, essentially continue the Nazi operation. And so they created a program called Gladio, G-L-A-D-I-O, just go online, search for it, and you'll learn a lot about it. Gladio was a uh, essentially a Nazi fascist program throughout Europe being run by the CIA to destabilize any government that might appear that they were gonna go communist. So whether it was in Greece or whether it was in Italy where it looked like the communists were gonna win free elections, Gladio was sent in to terrorize, create incidents and blame them on, on the communists when in fact it was the, in, like in Italy, uh, Gladio went in and was killing people like crazy, bombing places, and they were blaming it on the communists. And that helped ensure that the communists then could not be elected when in fact it was the CIA operation uh, really being run by the former Nazi General Reinhard Galen. Uh, also, uh, when you talk about the uh, the, the uh, after the coup and the time when uh, the government in Kiev was drafting people, for forcing the young Ukrainians into the military, their mothers were organizing buses to send them to Russia. And well over a million uh, of these mostly younger people uh, went to Russia to escape uh, you, the, the draft in Ukraine because they didn't want to kill their own fellow citizens. But even today, I was just watching a video just right before we started this interview where Ukrainian soldiers <clears throat> in the Donbass, whose job it is, is to attack uh, the Russian ethnic people. They're now fighting <clears throat> against the LPR, the DPR, and against the Russian forces in that region. They're <clears throat> refusing to fight in growing numbers, saying that their commanders have split. They hopped in cars and took off, went back home, left them there, told them to stand there and fight against Russian tanks. And all they have is machine guns. And they're running out of food. They're running out of water. They're even running out of ammunition. And so their wives back home, again, I've seen this on video just this week, their wives back home have been searching for and finding these commanders. And then they've been going and confronting them publicly, videotaping it and putting it on, <clears throat> on the internet, showing how the wives and mothers of these soldiers who were nothing more than Ukrainian soldiers who are nothing more than cannon fodder for this US NATO war against Russia uh, are resisting uh, and, and fighting against uh, the, the, uh, the Ukrainian military. So it's really a, a amazing situation. And of course, none of this that we're talking about now is being at all reported in the Western media. You have to learn about it from alternative media. Uh, I would recommend people go to my blog <clears throat> because every day I'm telling these stories, I'm sharing these videos. My blog is called Organizing Notes, N-O-T-E-S, Organizing Notes. If you just search for that with my name, you should find it without any problem. Yeah, I think that this Maidan coup 
is really important because like you say it's not being covered and it it's to understand that this is a, a united states nato war proxy war against russia then we have to sort of take a closer look at that so you were talking about uh oliver stone's documentary uh ukraine on fire last time and so i went and watched that and i, I was just knocked out by it you know and i've been sharing it with all my friends and everything and uh i've been in touch with the director uh and he said uh i could actually use any of oliver stone's documentaries on ukraine that i wanted to so i wanted to play some clips from uh, uh ukraine on fire uh i thought maybe i could find a real simple clip it was talking about the maidan coup but uh actually the whole thing is pretty much about the maidan coup but i, I boiled it down to about 15 minutes he had the time to make one last gift to his supporters from Western Ukraine. Finally, I want to say something that millions of Ukrainian patriots have been waiting for for many years. I signed a decree for an unbreakable spirit, heroism, and self-sacrifice in the struggle for the independence of Ukraine. I am granting a status of a hero of Ukraine along with the order of state to Stefan Bandera. Glory to Ukraine. The hero status of Stepan Bandera was short-lived. In 2010, Viktor Yanukovych was elected president. In January 2011, Viktor Yanukovych repealed the hero title of Bandera. Almost four years into his presidency, though, another revolution shook Ukraine. Unfortunately, this one was anything but peaceful. We had two partners. First of all, we counted upon the International Monetary Fund, but throughout the whole year of negotiations, the IMF suggested us unacceptable solutions. Significant raise of utility rates, first and foremost for the electricity and natural gas. This would mean a lot more expenses for the people while their income would stay at the same level. We didn't go there. We suggested other solutions, but got an official refusal from the IMF in November of 2013. This left us with Russia. Russia told us that it was ready for partnership if we took its interest into consideration. Our negotiations with Europe didn't succeed, so we decided to take a pause. Violent clashes erupted in the Ukrainian capital, Kiev, as more than 100,000 people protested against a government decision to delay an association deal with the EU. There was a big number of NGOs financed from abroad. Lots of journalists working for grants. Robert Perry is a longtime investigative journalist based in Washington, D.C., best known for his major disclosures about the Iran-Contra scandal in the 1980s. He is the founder of Consortium News, where he has reported extensively on the crisis in Ukraine and the forces behind the unrest. One thing we saw in the 1980s, at that point the Central Intelligence Agency had been largely discredited because of scandals that had been exposed in the 1970s. For 15 years, the CIA has secretly financed overseas activities of the National Students Association. But then there came to light a fantastic web of CIA penetrations. So when the Reagan administration came in, there was this concept that instead of having the CIA which traditionally would go into these different target countries, funding their media, funding NGOs, funding uh, different political operations. That was essentially farmed out to a, a new organization called the National Endowment for Democracy, which was created in 1983. 
And it would do pretty much what the agency used to do. It would go into one of these countries and it would support various political groups, train activists, uh, deal with journalists, uh, business groups, and try to advance U.S. foreign policy interests, sometimes against the interests of the, of the host government, the target government. November 30th of 2013 became the first turning point of Euromaidan in one of its most reported and mysterious events. News media reported that the riot police cruelly attacked the students peacefully sleeping in their tents. But scenes from the event seem to tell a different story. It appears that the protesters were waiting for the police. Additionally, there were dozens of journalists and cameramen from all the new public TV news outlets prepared to cover the events. And most ominously, a group of well-trained young men arrived to Maidan almost simultaneously with the riot police. They infiltrated the crowd and began provocations with insults, stones, and torches. The right sector in Ukraine represents a part of the Ukrainian population that has often favored fairly extreme right-wing positions. They had militias that came especially during the Maiden protests. There were groups that were being shipped into Kiev where they would provide the muscle, in effect, for the demonstrations. So the demonstrations went from being relatively peaceful political protests to being increasingly violent. Outraged by what was reported in the news, the Ukrainian people came out in force on the next day to vent their anger with the police actions. The events taking place in Kiev at that time were highly radical. There were neo-Nazi organizations participating. There were young people armed with bats and metal bars. They also used road-building machinery. With bulldozers, they ran into the police officers, who were guarding the governmental and president administration buildings and didn't let the protesters seize these buildings. How could the president go to such an unruly crowd? Who was he supposed to talk to? The techniques launched at that time were planned well in advance. As veiled and masked as the color revolutions can be, an attentive viewer can see subtle patterns and similarities revealing their true nature. To make crowds act as one obedient group, they have to be united at the unconscious level. The masterminds of color revolutions know this well and have perfected the art. Symbolism is one of the most powerful tools to achieve this end. Revolutionary political organizations with surprisingly similar names and even more similar logos have appeared time and again, almost as omens marking the countries that would be hit by the colored plague next. They are often described as being aware and active when they're actually trained and radical. They are the ones who take the first shot literal and metaphorical, to transform the peaceful protests into full-blown coup d'etats. Their fingerprints can be found everywhere on the map of the color revolutions. Using all the experience of past generations, simple but effective tools like catchy sing-alongs and chanting are employed. Together power, together power. Well known for exciting the crowd and creating a group identity, they depersonalize individuals and make them easier to manipulate. Who is not jumping is a Ruski. Who is not jumping is a Ruski. Thank you, friends. Glory to Ukraine. Slow Ukraine! A Ukraine that stands with Europe and stands with the United States. Well, members of Congress were visiting Ukraine during that period, most famously Congressman John McCain. So some of the people who were uh, challenging their government, their elected government at that point, were, were being told by the senior U.S. official, a person who ran for president and a top official in the U.S. Congress, that the U.S. was with them. I'm Senator John McCain, and it's always a pleasure to be back in Ukraine. Senator McCain was, uh, in, in a sense, giving the people in the Maiden are feeling that they had the, the backing of the most powerful country on earth. This is about the future you want for your country. This is about the future you deserve. 
There was headquarters in charge of the whole process in the U.S. Embassy. In early February of 2014, as the Maiden crisis was getting more violent, there was a phone call that was intercepted. It was a call between the Assistant Secretary of State for European Affairs, Victoria Nuland, and the U.S. Ambassador to Ukraine, Jeffrey Pyatt. Questions of credibility are being raised after a private chat between two top U.S. diplomats was leaked online. I think Yats is the guy who's got the economic experience, the governing experience. He's, he's the guy, you know, what he needs is Cleach and Tony Book on the outside. I, I, I just think Cleach going in, he's going to be at that level working for Yats and Yuk, it's just not going to work. Yeah, no, it, I, think that's, you know? I think that's right. Okay. Good. Well, do you want us to try to set up a call with him? Here's the next step. Sullivan's come back to me, uh, VFR, saying you need Biden, and I said probably tomorrow for an attaboy and to get the deets to stick. So okay. Biden's willing. So you had this remarkable phone call where you have these two senior officials of the U.S. government apparently talking about a coup or how they were planning to restructure the government of Ukraine. Fuck the EU. No, exactly. I'm not saying the whole U.S. government feels that way. The there is, there is division on this, but the neoconservative element wants very much to change the strategic dynamic in Eastern Europe. The neocons are very smart people, and they've been at this for a long time. They came in around the issue of propaganda. They studied how to create hot buttons for the American people. They had this experience when they were getting the American people to get excited about Central America back in the 1980s. Sandinista regular army. The ground force is being equipped now with Russian artillery. And they've been applying those same strategies ever since. They remain very dedicated to achieving their goals. They still want to get rid of certain governments. They wanted regime change in Syria, for instance, regime change in Iran. They're very skilled at this, and they have a lot of allies now inside the news media, inside the government, and that means that they can do a lot to control the narrative of any story. I think in America these days, we have somehow told ourselves that there are a lot of ways of dealing with these problems other than hard power. Vladimir Putin cares about hard power. The neoconservatives can now demonize a leader of a country. That sells with the American people. So you don't just sort of argue a policy. You attack the leader. So the neoconservatives became very skilled at picking out leaders, finding their ugly traits, and then highlighting them. Yanukovych, he might say was a rather clunky political leader, but you make him into a devil. He's, he's totally corrupt and he's evil and he wants to kill people in the Maidan, these wonderful white-hatted demonstrators. So you've got a black hat versus white hat. And, that, and they, you keep repeating that basic scenario. And it works with the American people. You've got to realize what Vladimir Putin is. He's an old KGB colonel that wants to restore the Russian empire. You make them into demons, and the American people find that the way they can understand the world. Once that happens, it's very difficult for journalists or anyone else to say, you know, hold it, that guy, he's got more of a gray hat than a white hat or a black hat. Uh, and if you say that, you suddenly are you're a Yanukovych apologist or you're a Putin apologist. And, and then the attacks come on to the person saying it, the journalist, the academic, or whoever. For weeks, this European capital has been the scene of a violent uprising. Today, the bloodiest day yet. The protesters are pushing up towards the government district, armed here with Molotov cocktails, but we saw handguns and shotguns too. There are casualties on both sides. The protesters were filmed leading a long line of riot police away. It's not clear where they were taking them. 67 officers are currently reported to be missing. 14 policemen dead and 43 wounded. There were 20 policemen dead and over 150 injured with gunshot wounds. Then, on 20th and 21st of February, it was already clear that the coup d'etat had begun. The Ukrainian president and the leaders of the anti-government protests there have agreed on a truce. The reached agreements don't meet our requirements. Right sector will not put down the arms. Right sector will not lift a blockade from a single government building. Before they fulfill our main requirement, resignation of Yanukovych. 
And the next day, Mr. Yanukovych left for the second biggest city in the country, Kharkov. As soon as he left, both his residence and government were seized by armed people. The matter is that I left for Kharkov by helicopter. My motorcade left on its own, but nobody knew that. As the presidential vehicles were driving, they opened fire on them. Also, our intelligence service had information that there were mercenaries, whose mission was not to detain President Yanukovych, but to execute him. I asked President Putin for a permission to enter the territory of Russia. Okay, so uh, I was reading Oliver Stone a couple months ago. He put out a thing on Facebook where he said that uh, invading Ukraine was a mistake by Putin, right? And they gave all these reasons why he thought so. You know, there were good reasons. It's kind of backfiring, at least according to him, you know, backfiring a little bit on Putin. But uh, then he gets down to the bottom and he says, well, what, what's the alternative, right? And so the alternative would be to have a million Russians, <laughs> Russian-speaking citizens, uh, refugees from the Donbass, you know, because Ukraine would have invaded the Donbass and, and then that would have caused a major crisis. And then, you know, so that's something that would be difficult to deal with, right? And, and so anyway, you said before, you said that, uh, like, what's the alternative? And as far as I'm concerned, I don't really see one that Putin had. Can you talk about that a little bit? Just imagine if uh, Putin had sat back and the Ukrainian government had sent its 180,000 Nazi-led army into Crimea, into uh, the Donbass, uh, a million refugees or more flowing into Russia. And then guess what? NATO then puts a base right exactly on the Russian border. They put missiles right on the Russian border. Today, the United States has deployed missile launch facilities in Romania and Poland that can fire nuclear capable first strike attack Tomahawk cruise missiles into Russia that would reach uh, Russia in just a very a few minutes. Well, it would be even worse if they were setting up those bases right on the Russian border and what used to be then Russian ethnic Ukraine. So I don't think Russia really had much of a choice. I think they had to respond. They knew they did. And so they did. And they also wanted to save lives. They were trying to make sure that this carnage that the United States and NATO were pushing the Ukrainian government to undertake they were, Moscow was trying to make sure this carnage didn't happen. And so they, they really, again, had very little choice. And while some people complain that, or they say that, you know, Russia's losing because this thing's been going so slow. Well, Russia has been saying all along that we're not trying to do an American style war like shock and awe in Iraq in 2003 where you just go in and, and bomb everything. Uh, Russia has been trying to go in slow in order to uh, limit the civilian deaths, but also limit the deaths of their own army and that of the Ukrainian army. But then what has happened is that the United States has ordered the Ukrainian army to set up firing positions inside of schools, hospitals, churches, apartment blocks, uh, forcing people out of their apartments. They go into the basement. And then uh, as the Russians began to come into those areas, 
uh, the Ukrainian army is shooting at them from these civilian civilian uh, locations that have been turned into military bases, essentially. And now that, uh, for example, now that things are finished, now that Russia has taken full control of Mariupol, we're now seeing all these videos where inside schools and hospitals and daycare centers and churches and apartment blocks, there are all kinds of stores of military hardware where they brought in all these weapons uh, into these civilian locations. So when people see all these images of buildings that have been destroyed, it was because Russia really had very little uh, a choice. If they wanted to take out these Nazis, the Azov Battalion in Mariupol, that was hiding in these homes and these, in these uh, hospitals where they chased out the patients and then took full control and turned it into a military post. Russia didn't really have much choice. So this is what the war has turned into. And the United States is repeatedly uh, asking or demanding actually that Kiev continue this same kind of operation of using civilians as uh, shields, which is illegal under international law under the rules of war. And so uh, it's very clear to me that the United States and NATO are running this war and they have no concern whatsoever. They talk a lot about the Ukrainian people, but they have no concern about the Ukrainian people. And now they wanna extend the war even further. Congress has just uh, 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 endorsed this program that Biden requested for $40 billion, $40 billion more to send more military hardware to extend the life of this war. And you have to ask yourself, why does the United States want to do that? And to answer that question, I think all we have to do is go to the Rand Corporation study called Overextending and Unbalancing Russia. It was published in 2019. It's online, you can find it. And in that study, they basically say that we can use Ukraine as a hammer in order to destabilize and to force regime change inside of Russia. Now, why does the United States so badly want regime change that it's willing to risk nuclear war, World War III, with a nuclear armed Russian government? And I think the answer to that question is climate change. Because of the melting of the Arctic ice, Russia has the largest border on the, on the entire planet with the Arctic region. And because as the Arctic ice melts, it will be possible to drill baby drill up in that region. It's interesting to know that the very day that this war started on February 24th, the US and NATO began a war game starting at the NATO, excuse me, the Norway-Russian border up in the Arctic region. And they called it cold response, where the US and NATO were practicing a war with Russia. So this plan to break Russia up into smaller countries by forcing regime change that would allow the resource extraction corporations easier access to that large border. Russia has the most resources of any country on the planet. And don't we know by now that all of the US wars these days are resource wars? Don't we know that, that that's the MO, the modus operandi of the United States? It's the hired gun for the oil corporations the resource extraction corporations. Back during the 2003 shock and awe of Iraq, I was watching C-SPAN one night and they had a presentation by a Naval War College instructor by the name of Thomas Barnett. He had just written a new book called The Pentagon's New Map. <clears throat> and he was making a presentation to a large auditorium full of uh, military brass and CIA 
uh, agents. In the introduction, they explained that this was the CIA and leading military officers in the audience. And in this presentation, uh, Barnett said two things that I think are really important. Number one, we're not going to do treaties anymore because treaties restrict our ability to uh, go and control parts of the world that we wish to control. And so it's no coincidence that the United States has pulled out of the ABM treaty, the Anti-Ballistic Missile Treaty, and the Inter Intermediate Nuclear Forces Treaty that banned uh, nuclear weapons, theater nuclear weapons in Europe, uh, the, the, both these treaties with Russia. And, and Barnett also said that America's role under corporate globalization of the world economy, which is what we have today, will be security export. He said, we're not going to make things in America anymore. We're not going to make shoes, cars, refrigerators, cell phones, clothes. It's cheaper for the corporations to go overseas, cheaper labor overseas. He said, our role will be security export, endless war on behalf of these corporate interests. And so that's what we have today. And so the sons and daughters of working class and poor people across our country are constantly being sent to war, not to protect us, not to protect democracy, not to promote democracy and freedom, no, to promote the interest of corporate power. Corporations have taken control of our government. You know, during World War II, Italy's fascist leader, Benito Mussolini, defined fascism. He said it's the wedding of corporations and government, the merger of corporations and government. That's what we have in America today. We have a fascist government that is using fascist shock troops in Ukraine to destabilize and to try to force regime change in Russia so that these same corporate interests can take control of the resource base of Russia. And Russia knows this, they understand this. Russia has been invaded in the 1600s by Poland, in the 1700s by Napoleon, in the, uh, oh, excuse me, in the 1700s by Sweden, in the 1800s by Napoleon, and in the 1900s twice by Germany, the second time by Hitler in World War II. And so here we are now in the 2000s, and once again, Russia faces another war, this time coming again from the West. It's very clear Russia understands what's happening. And they're determined not to allow the United States and NATO to overthrow their country and to steal their resources. That's what we have today. Yeah, and I have to add a little bit here that uh, uh, actually, as time goes on, this is becoming more and more evident. You know, the uh, Defense Secretary Lord Austin blabbed, quote, we want to see Russia weakened to the degree that it can't do the kinds of things that is done in Ukraine, unquote. And uh, Biden called for regime change in Russia. And, uh, you know, of course, Putin knows about this Rand Corporation document. And then I just saw something today. Joe Manchin, uh, in front of the World Economic Forum, said, uh, I'll just quote this. It says Joe Manchin, one of the most powerful elected officials in Washington, tells the WEF that he opposes any kind of peace agreement in Ukraine and only wants total victory with the ultimate goal of regime change in Russia. In the next clip, he calls this war an opportunity. And that's in quotes. So, uh, kind of, there's just kind of admitting. Let's don't forget that Senator Manchin from West Virginia is an agent of the coal companies, all right? So, you know, uh, he, he works for the resource extraction corporations. He doesn't work for the people of West Virginia. He works for the corporations. 
So I've been broadcasting the uh, Tr Cold War Truth Commission, and I haven't broadcasted for a long time because there's all this stuff about Ukraine. All right, so last week I was editing part seven, and uh, in there, Peter Phillips is talking about his latest book, Giants, the Global Power Elite, where he's actually talking about this very subject that you're, you're talking about. I wanted to play a clip from that. Main point of my book, The Giants, the Global Power Elite, was that if we look at what the Cold War and the US military empire is about, it's primarily the protection of concentrated global capital and the ability for people with money to move it anywhere in the world to invest without any interference from other governments or local populations. That's what a military empire is about, what it's for. That's the primary, that's the primary reason. So driving this engine of global wealth concentration are giant transnational investment companies like BlackRock, who control $7 trillion worth of capital. Uh, they, they, in 1917, I mean, in 2017, there were $17 trillion investment companies that were collectively worth $41.1 trillion in capital. There's about 20 now, and it's closer to 50 trillion. These firms all directly invest in each other. So there's this huge cluster of centralized capital managed by only 199 people. Now the Atlantic Council just came out with a policy statement on China. They wanna see regime change there in the next 20 years. They had come out with a policy statement on, on Putin. They wanted to see regime change in Russia. So you have a, <clears throat> policy group funded by corporate money is making recommendations to governments, um, the, the NATO, the intelligence services, security services, the Pentagon, transnational government groups as to how they're going to manage global capital and what needs to be done. And that includes uh, regime changes around the world. So they also inform, they're also talking to G7, G20, the World Bank, International Monetary Fund, International Bank of Settlements. This is very core, it's global, massive amounts of, of, of money involved, trillions of dollars worth, worth of wealth. And the power elites are in support of capital investment. They're collectively embedded in a system of, of mandatory growth. Failure for capital to achieve continued expansion leads to economic stagnation, which could result in depression, bank failures, currency collapses, and mass unemployment. So power elites are kind of trapped in a web of enforced growth that requires ongoing global management and the formation of new and ever expanding capital investment opportunities. They really would like to get into Siberia and, and invest there wildly. Um, you know, they want total control and penetration around the world. That's what this capital is essentially about. So the biggest problem the, the global power elite face is that they have more capital than there are safe investments and opportunities. So they, this can lead to ri risky speculative investments like the subprime mortgage uh, tobacco that we had in 2008 and almost total collapse of, of the world economic system. But also it leads to permanent war spending. A major part of the profits and the continued growth for global capital, the 50 trillion, um, is war spending. That's a really, really great statement. Yeah, he's talking about this pot of wealth, mostly created by fiat capital, you know, from the um, Fed, right, to try to shore up the economy after the collapse of 2008, right? So they created all this money, quantitative easing, they call it, and it all ended up into the, the hands of these people that he's talking about. This is way more money than Bill Gates or Bezos or any of these people. It's controlled by a small number of people. And basically, there's more money than there is investment opportunities. It's it's like forty trillion dollars, so that's a lot of money. Um, so.
So that's kind of what's driving this. It's basically driving everything that's bad, right? The fact that people can't afford rent anymore, including me. <laughs> so at any rate, uh, I think these people need to know that context. I was talking about uh, Oliver Stone a little bit. He's talking about the uh, iron curtain of propaganda that's coming down right now. And, uh, you know, like, you can't, you can't even say anything like, uh, but you're getting, getting this uh, one-sided narrative from the corporate media. And anybody, he's, he, he says, it's really difficult to talk about it because uh, anybody that does is a public enemy, number one, right? And, and uh, you're getting outright censorship like uh, they took the consortium off of PayPal and uh, Mint, the Mint Press, you know, and then there was such a ruckus about the consortium that they changed their mind, but then they changed their mind again. And then they just eliminated the consortium uh, permanently. And uh, they, they've uh, deep platformed the RT and uh, took all of Chris Hedges uh, archives off of YouTube Scott Ritter was kicked off of Twitter and uh, the consortium editor in chief Joe Loria said, quote, given the political climate, it is reasonable to conclude that PayPal was reacting to consortium news coverage of the war in Ukraine, which is not in line with the dominant narrative that is being increasingly enforced. But the thing about it is we've never seen anything like this before. And uh, the, the, it's just an indication of, you know, how important this is, you know, to the power structure of the United States, that this go war goes the way that they want. That's right. You got it, brother. You got it. I have to add that uh, Ukraine on fire is kind of, they're trying to disappear it from YouTube, right? Yeah, yeah. But... Uh, you can still find it. People keep on putting it back. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm so glad that I was able to get you to come back on finally. <laughs> and at uh, any rate, uh, thanks a lot, Bruce, for what you're doing. I really appreciate it. You're yeah, one of my heroes. Take care of yourself. And uh, good luck, man. We're going to need it. Yeah. <laughs>